And uh, Bob Moore joins us from El Paso Matters. Uh, good morning, Bob. Bob uh, has been reporting along the border for, what, going on 40 years now, right? It, it, it's been a couple years. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> a couple years. <laughs> formerly editor uh, at the El Paso Times. We're going to talk about a lot of the issues, uh, you know, the turmoil in the district attorney's office is a big issue. Um, let's talk about El Paso Matters for a second. There's no paywall here. You can go over, and I, I, I will tell you this, not just to suck up or anything, but a, a vital source of information in this area. I, I, I appreciate that. And how do you manage to do it as a nonprofit who never puts up a paywall? You can access all of the stuff in El, El Paso pa Matters. El Paso it, Matters is a news site. It's not just you saying El Paso Matters, right? It's elpasomatters.org. Yeah. Uh, so tell us the business model and how, how you sustain that and so forth. So as you mentioned, it's a nonprofit, um, uh, which means that we rely on various forms of philanthropy, plus a little bit of uh, some, some other funding, but primarily uh, uh, philanthropic giving. Much of it comes from national foundations at this point, uh, 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 but a big part of it is contributions from people in the local community who uh, believe that news is important for a healthy civic society in El Paso, and so they donate. And one of the, the, the things I strongly believe in is that uh, uh, strong independent media is vital for democracy, but once you make that claim, you can't then say, are really important for democracy content is only available to people who can afford to pay for it. Oh, well, there are, I mean, That's there really are plenty. The, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they all uh, take that tack. Yeah, and, 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 and I understand why, too. It's a, it's a business model, but there's a contradictory message in, in there, and that's where, where I really see the advantage of nonprofit journalism as, as opposed to traditional advertising supported mm -hmm. for profit now, media. Now, the, the donors that you get, are those mostly, would you say they're more individual donors, foundation? And, you know, where do you, where do you get? Pro the probably about 80% of our funding right now comes from large foundations right. across the country and 20% comes from El Paso. We need to get that uh, to 50-50 over the long term mm -hmm. to be to be sustainable. So we need, um, uh, uh, and so just to put it in perspective, it, it costs right now about a million and a half dollars a year to run El Paso Matters. We want to grow it. Uh, so we have to grow that uh, that donor base. And in a community like El Paso, it's difficult. We don't have a lot of wealth in this community. It's a low-income community, as we, as we all know. So it's an interesting experiment. There aren't a lot of other people doing this uh, kind of journalism in a low-income community. I break it down, though. There might be some people listening, and just journalism and reporting in general, I think, has been beat up on uh, in recent years. I thought we're the might, enemy of the people. A lot of people might say, well, why is it important for a functioning democracy? See Bob, uh, and, and I think that's a, a, a perfectly fair question too. Um, and and I will be the first to say that much of the criticism of the media is an own goal, right? Uh, we've we've deserved uh, <laughs> some of it. We've lost contact with our community. Uh, we've valued speed over accuracy at times. Uh, we don't reflect the communities we serve a lot of times. So there's a lot of things we're, we're, we're trying to fix. But at, at the end of the day, a healthy community, and that's what I want to focus on rather than national news like the New York Times or something like that, which mm, is also sure. important. But a healthy community needs several things. It, it needs uh, a shared set of facts uh, so that we know as a community what's going on and what we need to, to address. Um, uh, it needs ready access to, to information. It needs responsive government. Uh, and, and all of that begins with strong independent media. Media by itself can't fix anything, but I'm convinced that you can't address the major problems of a community without healthy local journalism to tell people what's happening in their community. Who is going to do like investigative reporting on a local level if, if not, uh, you know, you got the local TV, but uh, even you know, they get stretched more and more every year. Yeah, and, and they'll acknowledge that they're not set up, uh, by and large, to do that. They can and that do used to be the job reporting. of your daily. It, you know, it, and a, it, when it, I moved to El Paso, we had two dailies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we had the, the Times was, in the morning, the Post, mm -hmm. uh, the Herald Post in the afternoon. There was an El Paso Post? That was most cities. El, most El, cities El, El, El Paso, of, uh, Herald Post. Yeah. Wow. My, the city I grew up closest to, Tulsa, had, mm -hmm. had two. You know, that was pretty standard. Now, it's hard to keep one afloat, and a lot of... A lot of cities have lost their, their local newspaper. And, and there's a lot of results out of that. Uh, there's uh, uh, really good evidence right now that when a community loses its uh, local newspaper and there's nothing to replace it, voting goes down. 
Um, interestingly, the cost of government borrowing goes up, and there's a lot of theories as to why that is, but the primary one uh, is that there's nobody to track corruption and to make sure government is spending money mm-hmm. properly so governments do things with their money that they shouldn't be doing. And eventually, it's the bond rating agencies that wind up doing the investigative reporting, and by then it's too late, and, and taxpayers have to pay uh, higher interest rates for uh, to fund their government. Well, Those are the kind of problems we're running I th- it holds people accountable. I think uh, uh, media. local, especially local, but investigative, you know, di- uh, deep digging and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff has kind of been on the ropes ever since we got a 24 hour news cycle where they, I feel like, and you tell me what you think, Bob, where it's like, let's get whatever we have on as quickly as we can and just keep it churning and keep it pumping. Well, some of these stories got to develop. Uh, there was an excellent movie about the. Uh, uh, the Boston newspaper. Boston Globe. Yeah, the Boston Globe. Spotlight. Spotlight. Yeah, Spotlight. It was an Incredible excellent movie, movie about how long that took to develop and how mm-hmm. much money you have to plunge mm-hmm. into something like that to f- to bring it to print and be accurate. There, there's there's a bunch of stuff going on that combines to drive that. Uh, uh, but but at the end of the day, it comes down to economic pressure that you don't have the money to hire the reporters yeah. to to to. to prolong the work and we live in an instant gratification society and so when you're a a, a tv network and you're trying to get eyeballs you need to constantly feed the beast and and so you have kind of this over emphasis on breaking news that really Mm -hmm. isn't breaking news at all Uh, so all of those factors combine uh, uh, to to put pressure on in-depth reporting and at the local level you, you you've seen a collapse of um uh, advertising uh, in support of local newspapers, and that's historically where we've gotten the money. So, we El Paso Matters is just finishing our third year of publication. We have Ooh. eight local news reporters. Mm-hmm. That's the same wow. number that the El Paso Times <laughs> has. Uh, wow. It's been around for 140 well, years. And, and uh, that used to be your workplace, mm-hmm. the El Paso Times, and I still subscribe to the paper. And it's it's that an comes important with the resource. Online, right. The, the thing is, uh, You'll often get your news a day or even two later. I mean, you can get it online, but as far as the thing that I'm mostly paying for, which is a paper, it a there's old. a lag yeah. that didn't ex- didn't used to exist. And, and and again, that's caused by all kinds of economic pressures. I think everybody knows that the El Paso Times is now printed in Juarez, for example. Um, uh, it's the, we don't have a printing press here in El Paso anymore. Um, did not know that. I didn't know. That. Oh, yeah. no, I certainly uh, didn't. Uh, so for for the last few months, the printing has been done in Juarez. There, uh, the deadlines that are required to. And it's not the only paper printed in Juarez. So they have these staggered deadlines to meet all of the print times in, in Juarez. And so basically the paper for that'll hit your porch tomorrow is going to have to wrap up around noon today or so. And so it, it, so even back when I was at the Times in, in 2017, the print newspaper had ceased to be a breaking news vehicle. Hmm, interesting. Right. Where are you, so where are most of the reporters that El, El Paso Matters has uh, from? Are they from El Paso? Are they uh, from all from all over? It, it, it's a mix. Most of them are from El Paso, but we've also recruited people uh, from outside El Paso here. And I think you really need a mix mm-hmm. of people. Uh, it, it helps to have a whole lot of people who are deeply familiar with the community. But it all, there's also an advantage to having people coming in with a fresh set of eyes on a problem so that we don't uh, 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 try to start normalizing things that really aren't normal. So we, we, we try to have a, a, a good mixture. All right. When we come back in a few minutes, uh, we're going to talk to Bob more. Uh, we want to talk about what's going on in the district attorney's office. I, uh, you know, I, your, what's up your with name, the cabal? Your that you're name in? has come yeah. up as part of a conspiracy. I want to get your uh, reaction to that. And are there uh, open invitations to the cabal? <laughs> can, can anybody join? <laughs> um, also, it's really hard. I, I feel like well, we're not giving the other side their opportunity, but the other side isn't taking the opportunity. I think there are a lot of reporters, and you're probably one of them, uh, that would love to have the district attorney explain their side of the story, but that's not happening. So let's discuss that when we come back a little bit. Bob Moore uh, from El Paso Matters. All right, Bob Moore uh, from El Paso Matters is our guest today. We're going to talk about some uh, El Paso issues. Let's start with, I guess, the elephant in the city, which is... um, at least the perception that there's major dysfunction in the district attorney's office. And uh, you guys have been reporting on that as well as the El Paso Times, our news partners over at KBIA. How bad is it? Uh, it's really bad. Right. Because I, mean, uh, I hear people, well, 
Well, you know what? I got a call from somebody, and I, I, I just thought I'd play this back for you. We don't get a lot of calls from people who are staunch defenders of the district attorney. And even the staunch defenders are not really that staunch. They're not really that rock-ribbed. So here we First go. First of all, if you're going to get rid of people in the city government that don't do their job well, you better start making trials like every 15 minutes. Okay, so here, th- this argument is, why are you going after the DA? There are other parts of the city that uh, we could do a better job in, or other people could do she, better at their is job. Is she just not doing a good job? Is that I think it? it's, That's a good or question. It it's beyond not doing a good job, right? The, the, her actions or inactions have, have clearly created a public safety risk, and, and this is what I mean by that. By not timely bringing these cases to the grand jury, and there are hundreds of them that wind up getting dismissed, about 20% of them are family violence cases. Um, as part of the bond process, when somebody gets out on bond, uh, and, and this is true in a family violence case, they have to, one of the conditions is they can't have contact with the alleged victim. Once those charges are dismissed, all of those bond conditions yep. go away. So um, uh, the, the, the one of the primary purposes of government is to protect the public safety, and that is breaking down in El Paso because of um, uh, actions and inactions at the district attorney's office. That's, I mean, uh, that, that may sound harsh, but the, the evidence is really, really clear on that. Th- this, this, this is an example of something where you get uh, some a lot of diverse groups who are very united in favor of law enforcement, which is what the district attorney's mm. office is, and that breakdown. Uh, I think all these different groups are saying is a danger, as you say, Bob, to the city. I, I think the same caller, and I don't know if I saved this part of it, said, well, most of those were just tickets anyway. Yeah. How much truth is there to that? How no. many of them were just tickets? None. Tickets don't require a grand jury indictment. Right. Uh, so all of these were either um, um, uh, low-level misdemeanors, all, all the way up to class one felonies. So class one felonies are the most serious charge short of a capital, capital offense. Capital, right. right. Uh, and so, so it's a it's a range. the The biggest um, uh, uh, group was um, uh, the domestic violence cases and drug cases. That the, those two categories probably made up the majority of the. It's well over a thousand cases now that have been discussed. Okay, well, right. Also, so it's not it's not inconsequential. Can, can I just ask too? Is it also, if you're innocent and waiting <laughs> for a trial, you're essentially, I mean, you can't get a job, some of these people. So uh, can you explain maybe on the other side, people who are maybe not guilty of a crime that are also kind of tangled up in, the, in your, this your, your life is on hold. And, and and that's one of the reasons the Constitution has a guarantee for a speedy trial. Uh, and so when, when you have uh, this uh, uh, offense uh, hanging over your head, and, and also in the worst case scenario, if you cannot make bail... Uh, you are locked up maybe for months, and you can't work, you can't support your family. Uh, there are all kinds of, of implications. And you bring up a very important point, too, that all of these people we're talking about, there is a presumption of innocence uh, that has to be tested, and that's why we have a criminal justice process, which we, we, we effectively have not had in any functioning way for for months now. Okay, so we heard like the the bad news of that thirty, forty five, or sixty days, or whatever it was, where where so many people. Is that continuing at that pace, or have they have they has the district attorney's office made any progress into the, the workload? They, they apparently have, I, and I will begin this by saying they don't talk to us, right? And so uh, I, uh, but KVIA and some others have talked to people in the district attorney's office, and they say that they've made some adjustments in their intake processes that prevent that it's 180 days after the arrest that you have to indict somebody or let them go. And they say they have better processes now. It's important to note that the person who was in charge of that, that intake process, was, was among contacted. the people let go when Yvonne Rosales took office. Oh, right. Well, now, and they weren't in contact with uh, Kelly Childress's office at all as far as KBIA was, has d- told d- me. That's they, public coming, up, coming up to the last uh, meeting that they had together where they were going over these cases. And, and the DA will say that, uh, you know, oh, the the uh, public defender's office, uh, Kelly Childress, should have talked to us. And then you talk to Kelly Childress she and they're like, we've been trying for months to, 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 to bring it so. up. Uh, yeah, so... Let me, let me go back to the call. So, you know, I want to make sure that we're we're giving, uh, you know, a comprehensive look at what's going on here. But it's hard to find 
well, you know, you can't get the district attorney to talk to you, and it's really next to impossible to get anybody uh, to speak on her behalf. So I'm not the caller. I appreciate the call. I just wanted to go, you know, seriously go point by point here to some of the things that the caller brings up. Because if that's the case against Rosales, then you better look at the city manager and the city council that votes in a poor city with no animal services that's even valuable at all, dirty streets, bad streets, schools lacking. Okay, so let me just, you know, let's, let's assume, I'll give it to you, there's probably areas we could do better in, you know? I, but is there anything comparable to the level of dysfunction and irresponsibility that's going on in the DA's office that we're not giving attention to? Does she have a point there? Uh, I, I don't know about the city manager. I think the city manager is, you know... I, as far as I know, they want to keep him around. They're willing to outbid other cities to keep him. So I haven't heard any threats coming out of his mouth to the <laughs> victims' families of August 3rd. The one big difference between being on city council and being a district attorney is that city council has a recall process where if you don't believe your elected official is doing the job you hired them for, you can begin a recall process. State law does not allow that for a district attorney. So that's a huge difference, and that's why we're having this this court process. Uh, I, I don't think it's a useful exercise to say uh, uh, basically what this caller is saying is that the only people we can try to remove from office are the absolute worst offenders uh, because that's a very subjective judgment. Uh, and what I would say is we at El Paso Matters hold the city council members and the city manager to account every week uh, when, when they meet. We track all of that. Um, we provided really in-depth coverage on uh, tax rates. And so we just had an election mm -hmm. uh, where people voted, uh, uh, among other things, to raise their taxes again by passing these, these bond issues. So uh, I, I think accountability is, is really important, whatever the public job is. But again, I come back to when you look at the basic functions of government, uh, probably the most important is to keep the community safe. And that's what's at risk right now. And that's why so many people, and as you mentioned, Buzz, it, people who are like super pro-cop and people who are defense attorneys, that whole spectrum, it all share a same concern that uh, the, the district attorney's function is breaking down. Well, in El Paso. Here's an illustration of that. Omar Carmona, the attorney who filed... Uh, the mm -hmm. paperwork against the district attorney was the defense attorney for a guy who kind of got out of a murder uh, charge, or a, uh, I think it was a murder charge. It, right? it, yeah, it, was, it was a murder charge, and, and it, it was uh, prosecu prosecutorial vindictiveness. vindictiveness. <laughs> and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible thing that happened there. Uh, first of all, again, to remember that this is a person who's presumed to be innocent, um, uh, he, uh, the, the DA's office, came into court and said, we're not prepared, Your Honor. Sorry about that. We've had six months and kind of forgot. Um, and so it's like, we'll let this guy go free uh, 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 on his own recognizance. And then when the uh, uh, defense was uh, moving for a dismissal, all of a the sudden they pivoted and said, oh, you know what? We're going to reindict him on capital murder charges and seek the, the death, death penalty, penalty. Right. for so a they, guy they were just willing to release. They flip-flop from... Released on, did you say his own recognizance? Uh, yep. On his own recognizance to a death penalty. Yeah, that doesn't add up. Yeah, no, and it it it, it is it is a, 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 a an abuse of power, and the judge dismissed the murder charge because of that abuse of power. That alone is a significant public safety failure. All right. Well, uh, and it's also sorry, but just just to pivot off of that a, a tiny bit is that there it's another pattern. Because what I keep seeing with Yvonne Rosales is our pattern. She keeps saying the same things, using the same excuses. This is something that Curtis Cox is being alleged of doing to the, the Hoffman family, uh, vindictiveness. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the, just the pattern of like pleading ignorance we were talking about yesterday too it's like at what point what at what point do you see the ignorance of the defense attorney's office turning into incompetence if it is if it has first of all that's a judgment that the court will make in this removal process and it uh, is going to a trial in March which how significant is that even it, it's rare the, the uh, we've, I, we've only been able to find in recent history one other district attorney in Texas who's ever gone through this process but I, I also want to point out that 
I think the district attorney also has a responsibility to address the public about these uh, allegations. And by and large, they haven't done that. Uh, uh, They obviously have a huge distrust of media. Um, that's evident, and not not only distrust, um, uh, you know, a visceral hatred in some in, in some cases. Uh, um, they, uh, t- to be really blunt, and I, you know, just because I want to be transparent, part of what they are doing is they are trying to kill El Paso Matters because they don't like our coverage, and so they're going after in a very ham-handed and and frankly incompetent way. They're trying to get the IRS to revoke our 501c3 status. Look, I, oh, you know, oh, wow. I want to I zero in wow. on that for a little bit because your name ha- had come up and uh, some other names had come up, and uh, it seemed like they were making some overtures toward, toward retaliation, and then they followed up by retaliating. Yeah. Is, is that what happened, Bob? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and, and it wasn't just with me. There are other people they went at and they you know they and when you look at the the tapes roger rodriguez who's the personal attorney for rosales uh in these recordings with this this family in juarez that they were trying to use to to uh to do yeah, who knows what. Removed, that, it yeah, seemed yeah because roger rodriguez insinuated he might be taking the role of the judge yeah. so that was weird so too. when when you l- look at those recordings uh it's clear they have what they frankly refer to as an enemies list. I mean, I have not seen this since Pre- Richard Nixon left the White House. But uh, and I, you know, I, look, I've faced criticism from government officials that I've reported on before. It comes with the territory. I have never seen a government official, let alone the the highest ranking law enforcement officer in El Paso County decide to respond to critical coverage by trying to kill the news organization that, that, that's doing it. And my name comes up repeatedly in the conversations. Um, uh, and Roger Rodriguez says that, you know, I'm about to take uh, some hits is what he's calling it. Uh, and when you look at the timestamp on that recording, it was shortly before, like within hours of when uh, the, somebody in the DA's office filed a complaint with the IRS seeking to remove our 501c3 right, status. Uh, you, you know, and I don't want to make this all about you, but one of the other things that came out of the transcript, uh, the conversation with uh, a victim's family of August 3rd. With who, Roger Rodriguez uh, who, and uh, who, who, yep, the, the families in, in Juarez, that he uh, Im- said to them, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, Bob Moore in El Paso Matters has totally been paid off by Walmart. Did you what does that Did you know? mean? Yeah, insinuating. Here's what I would guess. Conspiracy theories. Uh, you, you know, El Paso Matters is not profit, relies on all kinds of donations. I would imagine uh, Walmart made a, a donation to El Paso Matters. Am, am I correct? In, in 2019, um, because of the, the shooting um, uh, on August 3rd, Walmart uh, wanted to thank the community, especially the nonprofits in the community, for uh, the work they did to help the, the community heal. So as part of El Paso Giving Day that year, Walmart put up a million dollar match. So if people contributed, you can get part of a match from Walmart. So we got somewhere around fifty three hundred dollars as our share of a match. We were not even publishing at that time. Yvonne Rosales was not district attorney at that time. Um, I have never since gotten so much as a gift card from Walmart. <laughs> and l- the other thing that's important to understand is our donors. Uh, have no say over our editorial processes any more than advertisers do in in, in traditional newspapers. So the, one of the things that I want to highlight is that August 3rd, 2019 is the darkest day in this community's history. We lost 23 of our neighbors. Because of all of this circus, we have lost, the district attorney's office has lost focus on getting justice for those families and giving a fair trial to the person a- a- accused of, of, of these killings. That is what we should be talking about in this community is how do we Help. close this story, close these wounds. But instead, we've got this this circus going on where they they even go so far as to use this family who lost – a father and a husband uh, in the Walmart shooting to use that family for their own political purposes. Mm-hmm. And lean on, too. Yes. Like, when, uh, when that family ceased to be useful to them, 
Uh, they then turned on that family and from all available evidence um, uh, were responsible for a number of things uh, shortly after all of that happened and as Judge Madrano was trying to get the family uh, over here, um, uh, CBP revoked the visa mm-hmm. of, of the, the mom. And these are people who, like Manny in El Paso and Juarez, frequently cross the border all the time. Her visa was revoked. She was held for seven hours in a small cell um, at, at the downtown bridge. Um, uh, these are very, very serious allegations or, or very serious problems. And I, 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 it's important to remember that apparently – a lot of this evidence has been turned over to the FBI. Yes. Um, uh, the the removal issue for Yvonne Rosales may be the least of her worries right now. Well, because, Bob, one of the reasons that was given that the widow was held for seven hours was because she isn't technically a widow. They were divorced. And that was found out because of a filing that Curtis Cox made. So they're directly involved in that. And that was used as a reasoning for her to, you know, also have her visa revoked. I I think to answer, you know, we were listening. It could be criminal activity is what what I was saying, too. To answer the caller, yeah, this is different than just run-of-the-mill bureaucratic Doing a bad job. There's also (laughs) some... Possible criminal activity. uh, 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 Now, there's... This trial, will this be a jury? Who will be called for the jury? Will it be a, you know, what will be the setting? A grand jury type of situation? It, 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 it is a, a civil proceeding, much like a lawsuit, and state law uh, requires that it be done by a jury. Uh, so it'll be a, a 12-person jury like it would in, in, in any other civil case. Um, I, I, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that removing an elected official, somebody chosen by the people of El Paso, is a very, very difficult thing to do as it should be uh, and so uh, the the prosecutor in this case which is going to be the county attorney's office Joanne Bernal's office uh, will be asking the jury uh, to remove this this elected official if if this goes to trial uh, uh, it, it it you know it, now it, you think there could be circumstances that that had that off so a, a, you... a resignation obviously would head that off if it happens um, well let's uh, let's change gears we're talking to Bob Moore for El Paso matters what are the what are the underreported uh, stories? And, and I think, like as you were mentioning, a lot of stories uh, get underreported. But we we hear about the district attorney's office. I think this conversation has been great. What are some stories that uh, don't get an, as much attention or coverage as they should? Do you think? I, I I think the the biggest issue that that El Paso struggles to come to grips with is some significant um, uh, economic issues that are driving young people from from the community. Um, you know, if you ask most people, hey, is El Paso growing? They'll say, yeah, uh, because they see all this construction going on. But the truth <laughs> is uh, El Paso, the population in El Paso has see, essentially stopped growing about a decade ago. And the main reason for that uh, is the out-migration of uh, thousands and thousands of primarily young adults in, at the beginning and the midst of their, their professional careers. And the driver of that is the wage structure in El Paso. The average private sector wage in El Paso is about 60% of where it is in the rest of the state. Uh, and that creates tremendous pressure. So we lose a lot of talent. It's sometimes referred to as a brain, brain drain. drain. I've, but been, it, but I've heard mo- that term applied to El Paso for 30 years. It, and, 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 and it's accelerated. And it's not, I, I think you create, with a phrase like brain drain, you create the impression that these are just, you know, highly educated people that are leaving. And that is happening. But it's all across the board. If you're a skilled uh, HVAC technician, for example, um, you can make a lot more money plying your trade in San Antonio than you can uh, in, in El Paso. We have to and I talk somehow to, address that. I talk to a lot of these people, and what I hear over and over again is, you know, I would love to live in my hometown. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, you, you hear about people wanting to get out of their hometown. El Paso is one town where I hear a lot of people in Dallas or Houston say, I didn't want to leave, but I had to. <laughs> you know, well, I had to because of financial reasons. Right. Well, the city of El Paso has had uh, issues hiring people. Remember the weeds, the pulling of the weeds. And I, we talk, we we have an amazing recycling man. And I was speaking to him the other day, and he said that they are doing that work now. Um, some of some of the people that are already hired, they're getting paid more, but that the wage is so low, it's ten dollars an hour, and people can work at Wendy's for twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, well. Um, of all the different resources that I use for free, 
that I should really pony up for. <laughs> El Paso Matters is up there. Wikipedia is up there. I got to be honest with yeah. you. <laughs> um, a couple of pro science uh, podcasts. Well, I should I've probably got, be kicking I've got, in a, for, I've got a deal for you. Yeah, then. go ahead. Uh, hit uh, me. This is the perfect time uh, to donate. Uh, at the end of the year, we participate in a program called Newsmatch, and so anybody who donates to El Paso Matters in November or December can have their, their gift matched. Uh, we have some national foundations that are helping us out, but also some some local donors. The uh, Castron family that owns Casco Ventures, um, uh, Charles and Ann Horak, uh, and then uh, an anonymous donor have given us money. So uh, right now, uh, I can uh, tell your listeners that uh, the next $21,000 donated to El Paso Matters uh, uh, between now and the end of the year uh, can be matched dollar for dollar up to 1000 uh, uh by these local um, uh, uh, donors that have, that have helped us out. So this is a really good time to donate Great. and to, to maximize your, your contribution. Can you do that all online? Uh, and, and all you have to do is go to elpasomatters.org, and there'll be some, almost certainly a pop-up that will make it convenient okay. for you sure. to just uh, uh, type in your name. The, the other thing you can do if, if you're not quite ready to give and you want to learn more, uh, we have a free weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to, again, right there on the, the, the homepage. Uh, so you can get every Monday morning in your inbox uh, uh, a great summary of, of the, the important news that we've covered in the prior week. Well, one other thing, not only is there never a paywall at El Paso Matters, you don't have the content covered by po- constant pop-ups either, which is great. We, we try to enhance the user experience. That's obviously a frustration for a lot of people where you get assaulted by these flying ads. Uh, and again, I understand why companies have to do it. You have to pay the bill uh, but this is a, 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 a way that I think that citizens themselves can participate in the journalism that helps make a community better. Well, I definitely encourage and I am going to pledge right now on the air that I'm going to donate. Uh, to El Paso Matters. I encourage everybody who cares about civic involvement and keeping community, the community uh, and keeping the community democracy. informed and yep. all of that. I encourage you uh, to set something aside, uh, especially this time of year for El Paso Matters. Thank you, Bob. All right. Thank you, Bob, for dropping by. Thank we should you, do Bob. it again soon. Absolutely. All right.